How do organizations of all sizes improve their securities posture despite the risk and the lack of skills in the workplace at the moment? I'm James Rasmus at Tech Central, and this is the TCS Plus. Thank you very much, Ian McShane, for joining us. Ian McShane is the Vice President of Strategy at Arctic Wolf. Thank you, Ian. Hey, happy to be here. Thank you. So, Ian, let's just jump straight into that topic. You know, the skill shortage is something we've, we're, we're acutely aware of, especially here in South Africa, but across the globe. But on the topic of, of security, we really need to address this and work out what are, what are we solving for? Could you, could you kick us off with that topic, please? Yeah, absolutely. So one of, it's, it's not a new story, right? Everyone has been talking about the skill shortage in cybersecurity for a number of years now. And even in IT, it's not anything that's new. I think, you know, over the past couple of decades, IT has expanded in such a way that there is just more technology, more jobs, more tasks, more things to do, to manage, to maintain and to implement than there are hours in the day. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there are many, many organizations, the majority of organizations just can't afford to hire people ad hoc and, you know, spend all of their investment just on the security team. Right? At the end of the day, it's a balance. And what organizations want to do is, is be able to continue to transact in the face of a you know, rapidly changing threat landscape, which makes security very, very important. But it also makes security very, very hard to get right. And Ian, I think what you're defining is the challenge. And what I'm hearing also is that there might be a very a, a discrepancy between the, the, the small startups, the medium-sized businesses, those medium enterprises. And then also there's this unfair advantage that some of the larger corporates and enterprises do have. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to chat a bit about that and see where, where, the, where the risk might fall, because my guess is there's an equal risk across all sizes of, of organizations. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the risk... There used to be this train of thought that an organization was too small to be of value to an adversary. And we've seen that tactic change over the last decade, especially with the, the explosion in ransomware in the past five years, at least. There is no organization that is immune to cyber risk and cyber threat. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that every single organization big or small, at some point, it's going to be either the target of a cyber incident or they're going to be the transport of a cyber incident, which means they're going to be you know, used to access or to launch an attack against someone else. So there's, there's no such thing as um, immune or uh, too small for, uh, mm. to, to have cyber mm. risk. What's important, though, and you mentioned it, you mentioned one of my favorite or, or least favorite ways to think about it is that some organizations do have that unfair advantage, right? If you look at the, the larger organizations yeah. that can afford to staff their security team 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year, yeah. versus a small organization that has one person responsible for all of IT and security. And my guess is there are similar tools that are common across both organizations, big or small. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're as obvious as Microsoft 365 or whatever mm -hmm. other, you know, tools you have available to you, but aren't necessarily being used in the right way because a small organization is too busy trying to get the product out the door and clients yeah. in the door versus yeah. the big organization who, as you rightly say, have scale and, and capacity. How do we identify yeah. what that problem looks like across those different organizations and actually operationalize it to solve for this risk? Yeah, I love it. You're, you're hitting all the, the right words. Operationalizing is, is really the the key to solving a lot of the challenges in security. Because look, there's been security tools have been around since, gosh, the mid nineties, I think was when the first kind of commercial AV scanner was around. So we're talking quick maths, 30 or 40 years almost uh, later, and everyone has tools out of the wazoo, right? They're, they're, everyone's yeah. got some kind of tool to prevent network or detect network. Um, Anomalies, people have got endpoint stuff that's either baked into their, their operating system or that they bought from somewhere else. So everyone's got tools. Like there's not, yeah. there's not a, there are very few organizations that do not already have the tools in place today to be successful. The thing they lack is the ability and through no means of their own, the ability to operationalize it because majority of tools are not written for mid market or small, um, smaller customers, right? Most cybersecurity technologies, especially the cutting edge ones, which you know often provide the best uh, protection, are written for experienced operators. They're written for large enterprises that can manage them and run them and tune them. 
so there's that unfair advantage right there of organizations that can use these tools well but that doesn't mean that other smaller organizations aren't using them already they just don't they don't have that unfair advantage and we're, we're immediately talking about the technology because so often that's the risk because you jump to you, you jump past people process and to, to technology mm -hmm. and you talk about the technology but actually there's a process that needs to be fixed and the people part is really how we started this conversation the skills yeah Exactly. That's what it boils down to is like, you know, everyone can, you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have the people with the processes to operationalize it, then it's a, it's basically a placebo. So how do we find and retain security skills? Yeah, well, it's going to sound very self-serving, but the, the reality is that organizations of all sizes are going to need to use managed services of some size or some, or some um, design to help implement, maintain, and operationalize security. And that's that's not just smaller, small enterprises, that's not just mid-market, that's that's true of large enterprises as well. And we start to see this transition a couple of years ago where organizations cannot afford to hire the number of people to be able to implement a strong security practice. And that's before you even start thinking about workflow. Let's do a quick math check here, right? Yeah. If you think about, um, so 24 hours in a day, if you want to do something that, you know, have a security operation that is running for 24 hours a day, because remember, adversaries don't take, you know, the yeah, evening they're... off while you're um, not at home. You know, they're not they're not thinking about, well, this is unfair. They're, you know, a 24 seven <laughs> kind of operation. Right. And yeah. um, so if you if you if you are building a security team and you need to staff that <clears throat> for 24 hours a day, that's what if a typical shift is eight hours long. That's three people to be able to cover just one day and the very basics. Now you have to think about medical leave and vacation and everything else. So maybe Weekends. another one or two people. Exactly. So you've already got five people that you need to hire to be able to do the bare minimum, right? To have one person sat in a seat for eight hours yep. uh, in, in every shift. And organizations, frankly, they, they just can't afford that, right? No, no. If, you're, if and, your organization is 15 people in total, you're not going to hire a third of your company or another quarter of your company just to run security. The math just doesn't work. And while you talk about costs, I understand the cost of entry just for the skills to be developed in order to be cutting edge and at the front of what's expected of them as yeah. those resources you refer to is, is, exactly. is very, very high. And you can't necessarily yeah. just say we have a small team of highly focused security experts because mm -hmm. they too might end up having to manage and operate too many different tools. Yep, exactly. Um, this, 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 the sprawl of things is just where it starts to get out of hand. You're completely right. I, I use the word manage and quite intentionally because I think one of the acronyms that Arctic Wolf uses is MDR, manage, mm -hmm. detect, respond. And yep. if, 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 if I think that I have a potential threat knock at the door or possibly even an existing threat inside my organization, mm -hmm. where do I start? irrespective of size <laughs> well so mdr is a great place to start and and let me tell you why like we have customers obviously with three thousand customers today uh, and growing in arctic wolf and every single customer at some point has already got tools like i mentioned earlier like there's mm -hmm. there are a few organizations that do not have the tools to be successful it's about operationalizing it so we take customers on we onboard them but we still find threats in their network we find adversaries hands on keyboard active you know active attack campaigns in you know i would say at least a third of the companies that we onboard really? and these people are paying a lot of money for technology you know they've got the the products that are in the top right you know of the magic quadrant or the you know forester waves and, and other analyst documents I'm sure are available, but our customers are paying a lot of money for security and it, you know, it's just not working out until they manage to get the operational side of things fixed. And a lot of the fastest way to do that, frankly, is to look at a MDR provider who can take all of the signals from your technology you've already invested in and make it work um, with our uh, security operations team. And also prioritize and deprioritize those which need to be tackled. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, so this is this is the the and again the difficulty with with cybersecurity is not all acronyms not all not all things are equal you know when there's one MDR vendor and another MDR vendor they're not always the same thing some of them are very standoff some of them are just you know hey we'll tell you when we think something's wrong and some of them like Arctic Wolf will provide more of a strategic lens as well not only helping you with the day to day tactical. Um, battle of dealing with alerts and potential security incidents, but helping you understand what it is you can do over the, the long term to really improve your security posture. And again, that might not be technology based. That might be more around um, 
educating your users and your colleagues on you know what the cyber threats mean letting them know how they can report cyber threats is is usually the first place to start for a lot of organizations rather than just hoping someone knows what to do when they see something wrong can we talk a bit about um arctic wolf's presence here in south africa you understand mm-hmm. you're, you're you're currently in the us you've also got a huge presence in the uk but you have an mm-hmm. office here in johannesburg south africa yeah and i'd love to understand a bit more about that and how your your global presence and the, the the size if i can use size as the quantity of data you process <laughs> yeah is going is helping inform the position and the the detection here in specific to south african clients of yours yeah so you know we we have predominantly been north america based for um since since our inception really in 2013 but i think it was two years ago we really expanded into europe so it's not just the uk it's also germany yeah. Uh, the Nordics, there's a, there's a whole area in uh, EMEA. We've also got um, our offices in uh, Australia and New Zealand, as well as South Africa, as you point out. And, and the beauty of having such a distributed, um, essentially a distributed data collection, is that we le- we're able to learn lessons from the attacks and the techniques that we see from all of our other customers and flip those into protection for everyone. So the more customers we have, the more data we get, the better protected all of our customers are. And so as we start to roll out into South Africa, they've, you know, we've almost um, jump-started a lot of the pain points that we had when we first moved out of North America, because we have already seeing a lot of the kind of the similar threats across uh, Europe and branching into the a- African territories. And what I'm understanding from that comments is that you passing on that benefit to, to us, the South African consumer, because we Absolutely. do have a major skills issue. Exactly. And, you know, you know, if you pointed out a few times, it's not just technology that's going to solve this. You know, we're bringing our security expertise as well. Um, you know, I was just giving you the, the maths example of how much it, it, investment it takes in terms of humans to actually staff something for 24 hours a day. The reality is that in that most cases, most of our customers pay less for our service where they get a world-class SOC than they would for, you know, being able to hire a, you know, a single person, a single IT generalist, not even a specialist with security. Well, thank you for putting that into context, because I think prices is, is, is a forefront of so many people's decision making. Um, mm-hmm. so, so too is, is being able to review the tooling that's currently in situ, um, yeah. work out what skills are required for that and, and what, where those mm-hmm. gaps are. How, how does that analysis work? And going back to my question earlier about where does one start? Yeah. Well, so the, the good thing with us is we don't we don't ask anyone to rip and replace anything because that's that's one of the painful parts of cybersecurity is that in order to generally you know replace one thing with another to get new improvements or new capabilities, it takes it takes some time. It's a project really to rip and replace things and, and put something sure. else in new. So the beauty with what we do is that we're able to work with whatever the customer has. We can start ingesting that you know, those signals, that telemetry, the data from those those um, uh, those tools. And that's when we can start to make some real interesting uh, suggestions about how you can fine tune things, how you can enable things. You know, many organizations are going to have some kind of endpoint protection. Maybe they've got some kind of email security. The reality is most of most of our customers come on board and ask us for help, you know, really with uh, setting their policies and making sure that they're, you know, using best practices that maybe they don't have uh, the expertise in, but certainly that we can use the expertise from all of our customers to help um, fine tune and you know put in place good security strategy. Yeah, great, and that 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 definitely assists with filling the gap between. I think you you said it earlier, um, not knowing what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing in that third party perspective is so helpful in that it not only addresses the talent gap, but it also um, raises the importance of the, what we're trying to solve for, which is in one's mm-hmm. um, sort of security posture, with a set of international expertise, data-backed decision-making, and, 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 and best-of-breed uh, settings. And um, I was going to say the, 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 the tweaking of the dials, yeah, which, exactly. which one That's doesn't exactly necessarily right. know how to do. So one of the really hard things to do as a kind of traditional or a legacy security vendor has always been convincing your customers to enable new capabilities because at the end of the day not everyone reads emails or blog posts to understand when something new is added and the paradigm for a security vendor is you can't always turn things on without telling customers because you don't want to break something you don't want to cause false positives and so this is how a lot of organizations fall behind and you know that's one of the reasons that arctic wolf is very good at helping tune 
customers' environments because we know what's available. Um, and so what, one of the most evergreen pieces of advice I give to organizations is no matter who your current vendor is, ask them to do a health check on your configuration because at the end of the day, your, your vendors, me, everyone involved in security and cybersecurity in general wants organizations to be secure. If you contact your vendor and ask them, hey, Symantec, hey, whomever, hey, CrowdStrike, hey, sure. hey, McAfee, whomever, can you just double check that my configuration is, is, is right and is using your best practices for today? They would be happily walk you through the right things to do because at the end of the day, everyone wants to be secure. And again, that's something that we, you know, we ex, uh, excel at because we have the visibility to see this over thousands of customers running, you know, multiple different combinations of products too. And it's in everyone's interest, as you rightly say, because you're, 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 you're creating a, a, a database of, of logic. You're creating the, mm -hmm. the, the you're building that brick wall higher and higher and higher and hopefully learning and anticipating and being, I suppose I think you've you, you may have used the word reactionary as opposed to being reactionary. We actually can start mm -hmm. to be a bit more um, insightful as to what's going to happen and look at those leading indicators. Yeah, start being more proactive instead of waiting right. for something bad to happen. We can learn from where it has happened before and be proactive against you know about stopping it from happening to other customers. Yeah, um, and we as we keep going back to this conversation about skills sh shortage, but you've mm -hmm. actually just pointed out the, the the fact that just by engaging and just by having the topic of security front of mind, we're all building each other's skills. Exactly. And that's, and that's another great part of this is, you know, I, I do often talk to organizations to say, well, I don't want to, want to replace my security person. And it's, mm. we're not, it's not about replacing anyone. It's about augmenting them. Like humans can only do so much. So if you want to lead a successful IT or security organization, you have to look after your people. It's not just about a gap in hiring. It's about yeah. retention. And, you know, when there are so many job roles, if, if someone starts to become, become unhappy, especially in cybersecurity, there's a great chance that they can find work elsewhere. So it's a retention True. tool as much as anything else is making someone's job bearable. And believe me, I've been sat in that security seat and sometimes it can suck. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. Um, the Chief Information Security Officer is often looking at tool stacks and reviewing those, mm -hmm. uh, those stacks and, and solutions. Um, mm -hmm. They're also addressing this issue of skills development. And I was going to spend a bit of time talking about upskilling and reskilling, but I think mm -hmm. we've touched on that. The, the last point I really want to make about today's conversation, which I, th I find fascinating, is that of alert fatigue. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the bit I said that sucks. Like I've been there. I've sat in front of a yeah. machine for nine, ten hours a day, just working through lists of these alerts, and you go through, and this it can become pretty mind numbing stuff, especially if you're doing it, you know, seven days a week, eight hours a day of you know just going through the yeah. same old things, and you can't you can't solve for it. And again, that's one of the the beauties of, of using a service like MDR because it protects your end users from that. It's in our interests to build the technology to prevent superfluous alerts being sent to you. So we want to com contact our customers with actionable things to do, not just letting you know that, oh, look, you know, we're able to take care of this for you. We actually want to work with those customers to do meaningful things and not, not contribute to the alert fatigue problem. Or turn off the notifications. <laughs> well, that's, and that's the other thing is, and you know, cards on the table, luckily, I think it was 20 years ago. So it's outside the statute of limitations. But there are times when I would just be like, do you know what, I, can, I really cannot do that again today. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. mute that one. And, you know, fingers crossed, it wasn't a real one. <laughs> Hope it goes away, <laughs> which it's not going to. And neither is our skill shortage. There's mm -hmm. nothing, there's no immediate fix to it. It's definitely something that's going to evolve. It's definitely something that we need to embrace as an opportunity and not see it as a risk. I think organizations that take their security seriously um, are, are watching and listening to this podcast and, and are, are definitely going to get gain and benefit from the experiences and the knowledge that you've shared today. So thank you very much, Ian. Um, and I also want to say, uh, absolutely. And any, any time, look forward to seeing you and, and having you on the show more often. I also want to say that there's a fascinating piece of work that you've, you, you've, you've titled the lab report, um, mm -hmm. which includes some of the top 10 security or cybersecurity predictions for this year. And that's available mm -hmm. on your website. So I encourage our listeners to go and review that and any other knowledge base and sharing that you, you, you do. So thank you very much, Ian. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, really, really enjoyed it. So Ian McShane, thank you very, very much. For me, James Erasmus at the TCS Plus, it's been a pleasure. And we very much look forward to future conversations and understanding more and more about what Arctic Wolf is doing across the world, but especially here in South Africa. 
So thank you very much, Ian.